Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Swazik Prado, and I come from the National Museum of Natural History. I will present you quickly uh, what, what is a museum, for those who, who don't know. And uh, I belong also to a CNRS unit, and that means the CNRS is a, a national, um, national research, a scientific research in, uh, in France. Okay, this is the National Museum of Natural History. As you can see, it's a very, very old establishment. And we are located in the center of Paris. And you can see here the red, um, uh, the red square is the place of the National Museum of Natural History. We have different uh, topics, but we are working mostly on ecology and also evolution. And this place is very well known for um, the different galleries, such as the Paleontology Gallery or the um, Grand Gallery de l'Evolution, that means uh, the Gallery of Evolution. But um, in the museum, we also uh, hosted the Royal Garden of Medicinal Plants, which is a uh, very old and which has been built in 1636. And this was very important for the history of the museum because this uh, garden um, um, exhibited all the therapeutic plants that can be used, all the medicinal plants uh, that can be used for therapy, thera thera oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, therapeutic uses. And this was very important for chemists, for example, because it was a possibility for them to isolate some plants and to, uh, to harvest some plants and after then to isolate some very interesting natural products. That's why we have also in the museum a very strong background in chemistry. And for example, um, the most brilliant discovery that uh, has been made in the museum is the discovery of the cholesterol. I'm sure that everyone knows what is cholesterol. And this, uh, this uh, discovery has been made by this man, Chevreul, here, a very, very famous uh, chemist who isolated for the first time the cholesterol and who determined also the chemical characterization of these compounds. We have also other famous discovery in the museum, also made by Chevreul, is the chromatic circles. That means Chevreul was working on pigments and he proposed an organization of the colors according to their contrast. This was very, very uh, new at this, uh, at this moment and with this has been also very helpful for painters using this, uh, this theory. This was for the formerly discovery, the previous discoveries. And now this is our team presently in, uh, in the museum. And now we are more working on natural products chemistry. And, um, it, and more precisely, we, are, we try to decipher the chemical communications involved in plant-plant interaction or plant-microorganism interaction. That's what I will try to explain uh, during my talk. I will start my talk to, to explain um, what is um, the plant's talk. That means plants are able to talk. This is a very, very, very new concept. And um, we will see that we know that plants can talk, but it's quite difficult to determine which kind of, of uh, signals are involved in this language. But as you can see, this kind of, um, of topics is very fashionable uh, because a lot of best sellers are uh, talking about um, the um, chemical language of the plants. Um, there is this book, The Secret Life of uh, the Tree, which is a very, very famous book which uh, has been uh, translated in many languages, I think so. And also this one, the intelligence of the plant and all these, um, these works um, uh, show that plants have a social life based on exchange and mutual assistance. And in, during this talk, I will try to show you what we know so far. What, what, what are uh, uh, the different knowledge that we can have um, on these uh, plant uh, interactions? The plant language, there are different ways. 
for the plant language. The first one, and the most uh, well known, is involving volatiles. That means small cues, small molecules, um, that can be sprayed from one plant to the other plant. This is, um, I will show you after, this is a, the, the well-known language because we, we know quite well these kind of compounds. But what is also very interesting is that plants can have um, physical contact and exchange by physical contact, but also, I will explain you this part after, they can exchange through their roots. And this is very quite new concept of the chemical communication through uh, the roots of the plants. As I told you, these um, chemical signals that plants exchange are signaling molecules, and these signaling molecules are also named secondary metabolites. That means they are very, very, very complex, highly complex structures that are produced um, uh, for communication or under different traces, and these secondary metabolites belong to different chemical series according to their structure. That means for example, you will have terpenes. Terpenes are one category of compounds, and they are all built with this kind of small units. And here you have an example, a very famous example, not involved in the plant interaction, but more in therapeutics, because this is the artemisinin, that means a very famous uh, drug uh, against malaria. But it's, this compound is produced by plants also. And you have also the alkaloids. These compounds are represented there and are very, um, very well known because they are very toxic and they are involved in um, defensive reaction um, very often. And these compounds are very characteristic because they bear here um, a nitrogen. This is a characteristic of, uh, of alkaloids. And you have also another group, very highly diverse group, with the name is polyphenol. I'm sure that you know this compound because, for example, resveratrol, I mean a very famous compound that you can find in red wine or other uh, plants, um, are also a polyphenol. It's a very, very highly uh, diverse group. This was just to explain you that um, if there is a chemical language, there is also different category of chemical language according to their structure. And what is very difficult for, for, for the chemist and for the biologist is to determine the structure of these chemical mediators. Because they are produced, I will explain after how we do to determine the structure, but it's quite challenging. Because they are produced, in, they are very active, and they are produced in very, very low concentration. That means often we don't have enough products to determine their structure and to determine after that their role in the environment. The other aspect which is very difficult is often it's not only one compound which is involved in, an, in a reaction or in a communication or in an interaction, but it's a very complex mixture of compounds. And the ratio of the compounds inside the mixture is very important for uh, the activity. That's why it's quite difficult, not impossible, but quite uh, difficult. And we assume that uh, we know approximately 25,000 compounds involved in the chemical communication. But this not only in plants, plants, but in all the, the interaction possible that you can find in an ecosystem. The first um, talk, uh, talk that I will um, explain is this of the tomato. That means it's one of the most uh, famous uh, chemical uh, uh, interaction or chemical communication that has been described. It's quite, uh, it's quite uh, interesting because if you have a tomato represented there, and if the tomato is attacked by a caterpillar, this tomato will produce a specific compound with the name is methyl jasmonate. And this methyl jasmonate will be a signal for the predators of the caterpillar. And like that, you will be sure you will have no more uh, caterpillar attack. 
This is very interesting because these compounds are related to the caterpillar species. That means you will not have the same, um, the same chemical compounds according the caterpillar species. And that means, accord, depending on the production of this compound, you will have specific predators or specific bodyguards able to fight the caterpillar and uh, limiting, uh, in such case, the uh, attack by uh, the caterpillar for the tomato. But what is also very interesting is that this was a defensive process. That means the tomato cannot directly attack the caterpillar. That means she will use uh, predators to uh, inhibit uh, the caterpillar. But this tomato will also produce signal um, molecule, signal alarm, with the name is ethylene, represented here. And this is not for a defensive purpose, but just to say to the other plants, be careful, there is some caterpillar, and like that, this plant can sense the ethylene and increase their resistance for the caterpillar. As you can see, it's a, it's a double, uh, double way, one for uh, the defensive aspect against the caterpillar, but the other one for, um, uh, for alarming the neighbor's plant. Another uh, example um, which involves also uh, ethylene. As you can see, it's a very, very small molecule, um, but very efficient. And um, there is also the acacia talk. If you look in the south of, uh, in the south of, um, of Africa, there is this kind of, uh, of plant, acacia, which are eaten by uh, antelope. And when the plant is eaten, she, the plant will release this kind of compound, will release ethylene, and in such case, you will have an increase of the concentration of tannin, which has very, very highly toxic compounds for the antelope. And in such, in the same way, this ethylene will be also a signal for the neighbor's plants, which will um, involve also an increase of the tannin concentration and um, uh, allowing um, the, a defense against uh, the antelope. As I told you, there are three ways for the communication. The first one involves some volatiles, and these two examples are volatiles involved in the communication to prevent uh, attack by different animals. But, but uh, as I told you also, um, the plants can uh, talk through their roots. And this is a very, very new concept and very, very interesting concept because we know that associated to the roots of the plant are living some fungi. These fungi are named mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae and are very, very, very important for the plants. And they are living, they are symbiotic soil fungi. Why they are important for the plants? Because they can bring to the plant nitrogen, phosphorus, and water, which are very, which are necessary for, for the plant. But in return, the fungus represented here can take some carbons and sugars that she cannot have without the plant. That means this association is a very true symbiotic association. That means it's beneficial for each partner. And as you can see, it's a very, very uh, characteristic, characteristic sorry, structure. This is a fungi, and this is a plant cell. That means you will have a penetration of the ephae, that means the structure of the fungi, inside of the plant cell. And at this point, you will have the exchange possible of nitrogen, phosphorus, water, and also sugar. This kind of, there are different kinds of mycorrhiza. This is, is the, most, uh, the most common and uh, because it concerns more than 80% of, um, of plants. This is um, very important for the growth and for the resistance of the plant. As you can see there, you have two, two examples of plants growing with or without the mycorrhiza. As you can clearly see, this is a carrot. 
without mycorrhiza, and this is a carrot with mycorrhiza. You can see that there is a very, uh, a very uh, uh, significant uh, difference of uh, the length of, uh, of, the, of the carrots. And this is another example in another kind of plants, um, which has been, which has uh, grown with without with mycorrhiza sorry and without mycorrhiza again you can see that uh, the mycorrhiza improve plant growth and resistance that means this is very important for the plant but what is also very important for the plant is that this mycorrhiza are able to um, build a fungal network and this fungal network as represented there you can see here, here are mycorrhiza, here, here, here. And this mycorrhiza allow uh, the links between all the plants in the forest. This is quite, this is very surprising and, and, and very interesting. And um, thanks to this network, plants or trees can exchange nutrients, but also chemical signaling and molecules and so on. That means it's a very, very, very highly uh, diverse uh, network and very essential. And this network can um, have a length of more than 10 kilometers. That means, I don't know how many it is in, in, in miles, but it's, very, it's a lot. It's very, very, very interesting. And this concept, uh, is uh, at this moment we know that the plants can communicate by this fungal network, but we don't know clearly which compounds are exchanged. This is not yet very clear because um, um, this experiment, this uh, fungal network has been uh, demonstrated by, uh, by uh, uh, a researcher, Suzanne Simard, working at the University of British Columbia, and she was the first one to demonstrate this communication uh, by the fungal network. And what experiment she, she performed? She, they, you can see here, you have four different plants, and they closed off each plant in a bag. That means there's no communication possible um, by uh, area. And they inject there a CO2, but with a specific labeling. That means it's a compound that you can detect easily. They inject some CO2, label it. It's, a, it's not a, a carbon, two, uh, carbon 12, but carbon 13. And after a few times, she looked in the different bag. And she observed that here you have also the same compound labelage. That means there are communication between the plants, not by volatiles, not by direct contact, but by the, um, the rhizosphere. That means um, by the fungal network that I have, um, I have uh, uh, explained before. This was a, a very, very, this was a revolution for the knowledge of the plant communication. Another thing that you have to do about this plant communication is that at this moment I show you that plants are communicating together, they are talking, they are exchange uh, nutrients and chemical signal and, and, and so on, but they are also strongly um, interact interacting with a, a very highly diverse community living in the soil. And this community involves also bacteria and fungi, not only mycorrhiza fungi that I, that I, I have described uh, before, but other fungi uh, living in the roots, but also bacteria. And this is a macrobiota. That means very, very, very uh, huge um, community uh, living in the roots of the plants. But as you can see, you have also interactions with um, nematodes, for example, or with other kind of, uh, of plants that can be uh, pathogens for uh, pathogenic uh, plants. That means this rhizosphere, the rhizosphere that means all the world living um, uh, around the roots of, uh, of, um, of, your, um, of your plant are very, very important for the growth and for the equilibrium of the plant. But what is also sure 
is that all these worlds are um, interacting by the way of the, produ of the production of small molecules. At this moment, we don't know exactly which kind of compounds are evolved, involved. We have some, we know for example that flavonoids are involved in some interactions. Here you have some trigolactone which are involved also, but you can see there are many, 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 um, many kind of interaction for which we don't know what is happening yet. Another uh, system which is very, very important and that uh, have been, um, uh, has been deciphered also are the interaction between plant and insect. This is also very important and we have a very lovely example of beneficial interaction. For example, you have this kind of flower, the passion flower, which are able to produce this kind of compounds. As you can see, there are um, uh, um, uh, strong, diverse compounds, sorry, but as you can see there, there is a, a red, uh, two atoms in red, that means it's a cyanide group, which is very toxic. And what is happening if there is an herbivore which attacks the plant, the plants will release this compound and hydrolyze, that means do the elimination of this groupment and you will have a release of a cyanide hydrogen. And this is very toxic and that means that the, the herbivore will say, okay, no, I don't want more, you will, uh, you will have a plant reject. But for some kind of caterpillar, they are um, able to use the compounds produced by the plant for its own benefit. That means this certain kind of caterpillar will be able, I don't know why it is now, but I will go back, um, are able to storage the toxic compound, this one, and this is very helpful for the caterpillar because like that, she will have aposematic colors and this will be a way for, her, for the caterpillar to say, okay, uh, don't eat me because I'm very, very, very toxic. And this is very in interesting um, uh, a way of using a natural compounds produced by the flower for uh, its uh, own benefits. Another example which has been well characterized from a chemical point of view is um, the pollination because plants uh, need the presence of insects to spread the pollen between the different flowers and for that they need to attract the different insects. And for example, in the, ca in the, in the, in the case of uh, this um, this plant, which is an aroma, the plants will attract the insects by emitting, by producing some volatiles with a very, very nasty odor. That means you will have putrid, putrid odor or rotting carcass odor and so on. That means this odor are mimicking the litter of the insect like that the plant will be sure to attract some insects and to um, to perform the pollination, which is very important for the plant. Now I will, I will talk about another kind of interaction which are very important also for, for the plant, and, but which involve more plant microorganisms interaction. We are talking about plant-animal interaction, plant-plant interaction, and now I will focus uh, my, my, my talk on, on my own work. Um, that means I will talk more specifically uh, about uh, on the fight. We have uh, seen that we have some um, fungi living uh, associated to the roots, which are very important, the mycorrhiza, but we have also fungi living in different other parts of the plant. And these fungi are named endophytes. And you can see how they are important for the plants. You can compare a plant with endophyte. This endophyte can be fungi, but also bacteria. Uh, personally, I'm working on fungi, but they could be also bacteria. Here 
is a plant with endophyte. That means the plant is, is going well. And here is a plant devoid of endophyte. And you can see how important are these microorganisms. And I will show you different examples that have been published um, 10 years ago. And um, we clearly proved how these microorganisms are very essential. Now, these microorganisms are living in the tissue of the host plant, and they have the particularity to uh, don't uh, cause any apparent damage. That means they are not pathogen. They are beneficial uh, fungi or bacteria. And it has been... Um, demonstrated that these fungus or these bacteria are able to provide resistance to the host plant and this against abiotic stresses such as heat pollution and so on, but also against biotic stresses such as pathogens. You can see there, and it's very, very clear, that means you can observe the length of um, the, the length of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the shoot of the plant um, under a specific um, salt stress. You must know that plants uh, don't like salt stress. And it is very clear that if you have a high concentration of salt, you will have a decrease of the length of the shoot. Um, but if you had an endophyte. Here is an endophyte that you have aided on your culture. You can see that you will improve the, the you will improve the length of the shoot comparatively with the control that means without salt. And if you have um, a very high salt stress, you will prevent the plant of the soil stress by the addition of the endophyte. That means this was very, very important work. And, and, and because this was one of the first demonstration of the beneficial role of the endophyte for the host plant. Another example, which is very clear. Here, for example, you, you, this are a plant um, inoculated with a phytopathogen. Fusarium is a very, very famous phytopathogen and, um, and for uh, wheat and corn and so on. You can see that there's no growth of the plant. That means the phytopathogen is killing the growth of the plant. But if you do a co-inoculation, that means if you had a pathogen here, more plus an endophyte, you will see, you will restore the growth of the plant. That means these endophytes are able to um, protect the plants against the pathogens. Another example which is very, very important is for the cocoa. Because the cocoa can be infected by a phytophthora, it's a no set, a very, very, um, very highly uh, pathogen, pathogenic for, for the tree. And this is very difficult if you have a contamination with this kind of, uh, of home set. And you can see there what the authors uh, did. They isolate the endophyte from different trees and different leaves. Um, and they demonstrate that if you look at the mortality of the leaf in the presence of the pathogens here, you will have a high value for sure. But if you had the endophyte and the pathogen, you will uh, decrease the percent leaf mortality. That means, again, these endophytes are able to protect the plant against different um, uh, pathogenic stresses. The sole problem is that we really don't know how this is working. That means what are the compounds? Are there a chemical communication involved in this protection? Honestly, we don't know. We just, there is just one, um, one uh, paper, one article um, produced, um, published by um, uh, Mr. Wicklow, who demonstrated that an endophyte isolated from the corn is able to produce this kind of compound which are very, 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 very toxic for the pathogens of the corn. 
That means this work was the first evidence, and the only one at, at this moment, uh, evidence that the chemical communication were involved by the, between the endophyte and the plant involve um, uh, that there is a chemical communication during the interaction. There is a chemical communication um, ab and uh, uh, able to uh, to fight the pathogen associated uh, to the plant. That's why another thing which is very important is um, a lot of chemists were working on an endophyte, because these endophytes are able to produce a very huge diversity of chemical compounds. And what is quite um, interesting is that most of the compounds produced by endophyte are able to display um, antifungal, antimicrobial, or herbicidal activity. That means that this observation could be um, also uh, led us to uh, have the hypothesis that maybe the chemical communication, the compounds that the endophyte produce are involved in their ecological role. That's why we start different uh, projects on this aspect. And also another thing which was very interesting about this endophyte is that some endophyte isolated from a plant are able to produce the same compounds than this produced by the plant. From an evolution point of view, it's very interesting, but imagine how interesting is it when you can isolate on the fight, able to produce taxol. I don't know if you know what is taxol. It's a very, very famous uh, compound uh, which is used, it's a drug now used against cancer, and this very a uh, highly diverse uh, molecule has been isolated from um, this uh, taxus, and the sole problem is that it's very difficult to synthesize these compounds, and also you have a very low yield um, of production if you uh, isolate the compound from the plants. That's why, from a biotechnological point of view, it was very interesting to find on the fight able to produce the taxol because it could be possible in such case to have um, to produce a large amount of the compounds by biotechnology or microbial culture and so on. In fact, it doesn't work. Uh, I will not have enough time tonight to explain why it doesn't work, but that means it's not the solution to produce, uh, to produce taxol. And we have many, many evidence um, in the literature that there is, um, that this fungus, these fungi are able to produce very, very interesting compounds, but also the same compounds that the plants produce. That's why this... Uh, and the five are very, very interesting subjects um, because they have an ecological role, as I show, uh, as I shown you, and also they are able to produce highly diverse compounds that can be uh, used for therapeutic or for the development uh, for the drug development. That's why we decided to work on this kind of, um, of uh, chemical communication and to decipher the production of the compounds by the different endophytes. For that, we decided to work on a taxus, a cephalotaxus represented there, because this, um, this tree um, were used in Asian traditional medicine, and also we know that these three were able to produce very famous compounds um, and also alkaloids, which um, obtain um, uh, a notarization uh, to be uh, for the drug commercialization. This was this what we were, we started to work on, and we determined the biodiversity of the foliar endophytic microorganisms. This is of the cultivable. That means this is a very, 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 very big work um, because we obtain a lot of strengths because each, um, each tree is able to uh, host approximately six or 700 different strains. This is very, it's a very high biodiversity, very interesting, but a lot of work. And we decided to compare with, um, 
with endophytes isolated not from um, a tree uh, growing in France, but from a, t a tree uh, from from a tree in Japan, because this uh, this tree is um, is. Um, is uh, the native area of, uh, of uh, the Cephalotaxus is Japan. And surprisingly, we obtained two uh, very different communities. It was not the same strains. That means there is a selectivity, a possible selectivity, a specificity between the plant and the microorganisms because the two communities that we obtained from France and from uh, Japan were very, very different. And also we demonstrated that there is an influence of the geography on the fungal and the communities. This, the idea was to determine if these endophytes were able to kill phytopathogen. Remember I told you in the introduction that these endophytes were able to provide a resistance to the plants, again, biotic and abiotic. Um, Stresses. That's why we perform such as bioessay. We try all the endophytic strain that we obtain, and we looked if they are able to fight um, phytopathogen such as Fusarium oxysporum, represented here, or another kind of Fusarium. And we obtain one strain able to limit the growth of the phytopathogen. This was very, very interesting. And I remember her hypothesis was that the chemical communication were involved in such interaction. That's why the first hypothesis was, of course, no worry. The endophyte represented here is able to produce toxic compounds against the phytopathogens. That's what we wanted to, uh, to demonstrate. And finally, it was not the case. That means the endophyte, where we isolated all the compounds produced by the endophyte. And it was not possible to determine one compound responsible of the growth inhibition of the phytopathogen. This was quite surprising for us. And that's why we were thinking that maybe we were wrong. That means there's no chemical communication involved in endophytes and phytopathogens. In fact, there is a chemical communication. But what we didn't know is that there are no compounds produced by the strains alone, but there are compounds produced only when you observe, when you have the interaction between the phytopathogen and the endophyte. That means an endophyte alone will not produce toxic compounds. But if the endophyte is in front of the phytopathogen, there will have, have some chemical signaling, and at the end, the endophyte will defend by, the pro by producing chemical compounds against the phytopathogens. This was very interesting. I will not uh, develop uh, the different methods that we use, but maybe for some chemists of natural products, if there are some chemists of natural products uh, in the room, we use some metabolomics aspects. That means we work in very, very, with traces, with very low amount of compounds to determine this observation. And what we observed finally is that there is a strong chemical communication. And this chemical communication involves that the endophyte is able to produce this kind of compounds. And these compounds will inhibit the production of the mycotoxin of the phytopathogens. That means there are a true dialogue between the two microorganisms. And this dialogue involves chemical compounds clearly um, demonstrated and, and uh, characterized. But what you have to, uh, to, to, to remember is that the interaction is necessary for the production of the compounds. That means they are not constitutive compounds, but inducible compounds involved in such interaction. I will just show you a, a last example of what can happen during a chemical communication. We wanted there to um, characterize what is happening between her endophyte 
but this time not against the phytopathogens, but against different bacteria that we isolated in the same time that, that means with endophytic bacteria, that means with bacteria that we have isolated in the same time than the, the endophytes. And I will, this is too much complicated, but I really would like to, uh, to show you this slide because we used a very, very, very powerful technique whose the name is um, mass spectrometry imaging. And this method, I will not explain what it is, but just you can have a map of the compounds produced in the course of the interaction. This is very helpful because, do you see, this is one part of the interaction. Here are the fungus, here are the bacteria, here are the competition that I show you. And this is the result that we obtain by this method. That means we can clearly show that from the bacteria, in the bacteria side, we have one main compound represented in red here. In the dual zone, we have one other compound in green. And from the fungus part, we have one blue compound. This is a, a, a specific um, a method for, for, for mapping the production of, uh, of metabolite. Of course, we wanted to know what was happening, and I will not uh, um, go through the details, but just to explain how, how the chemical communication could be important, because finally we determined that the fungus was able to produce this compound, and these compounds are antimicrobial. That means they can kill the bacteria, but in return, the bacteria will produce this compound, very toxic for the fungus. And finally, the fungus will use some enzymatic reaction to inactivate the molecules produced by the bacteria. That um, is another example of uh, uh, what's happening in the micro microbe interaction. But what I really would like to, to, to tell you is that at this step, I'm in a laboratory. That means I'm with a petri dish, and I'm working only with two microorganisms. I don't know if you have the idea of the diversity that you can have on the soil, that you can have on the plant, that you can have um, in, in the area also. This is very quite, uh, this is crazy. That means at this moment, we have no other way to work at the community scale. That means this is a very big challenge for the future, but I think very important. And now we have some tools such as genomics, which can be very helpful to determine what is happening in, in, in a community, but it's very, very, still very hard and very difficult. Another Last example, just to show you that it's complex because the characterization of this molecule are not easy, but also it's dynamic. That means, I tell you at the beginning of my, of my speech that uh, endophytes are beneficial and are very sympathetic and they produce some compounds uh, able to, uh, to, to provide resistance of the plants against different, um, uh, different stress. But in fact, they can be also pathogens. And this is a very, very interesting subject also, because in the community that we have isolated, we also obtain some pathogenic um, uh, endophytes. And for example, in such case, we, iso we isolated this compound, and we wanted to see what about the metabolites? This um, fungus, sorry, has been um, described like a pathogen for um, a different uh, kind of tree. That's why we decided to look at the chemical communication, what are the compounds produced, and what are their role for the plants. And in such case, we obtained this kind of compounds, and we demonstrated that these compounds are not able to fight phytopathogen, are not able to improve the resistance of the plant or to improve the growth of the plant, but they are very, very strong herbicidal and anti-germinative compounds. That means they are fighting the plant. And for example, we obtain results very interesting because here is um, the, um, the activity of the glyphosate, that means the Roundup, and these are our compounds. That means you can observe that we have one compound which is more efficient than the Roundup uh, commonly used. 
Um, that's why the other aspect I think that is very important in such interaction is that means it's not white or it's not black. That means there is a very, very, very teeny equilibrium, and this equilibrium is um, depending on different uh, factors that we, 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 and we don't know, we don't know very well how how to detect this equilibrium and how to to work with in the ecosystem. The last message that I would like to give you um, is about this chemical characterization, which is very, very difficult because, as I told you, we don't have a lot of uh, amount of compound. Uh, these compounds are very active, but produce a very low concentration. And thanks to the emergence of, um, of new technology, such as mass spectrometry, represented here, or um, nuclear magnetic resonance, we can um, now perform very, very uh, interesting uh, experiment with very low amount of, um, of products. And this is very, the emergence of these, uh, of these techniques are very, very helpful for the chemistry of natural products, but also for people who want to decipher this chemical communication. And just to just to give you an idea, because this compound is another subject that means it's not about plants, but it's the first pheromone that has been uh, characterized by, um, uh, by Adolf uh, Butenant. This is a bombicol, that means a very, very simply molecules. These molecules is produced by female and uh, to attract a male butterfly. And this uh, compound has been is isolated thanks to the dissection of 500,000 glands. That means it's a lot. That's why they obtained the Nobel Prize. Um, and because it was also the first demonstration of uh, chemical cues involved in a, in a in physiological uh, aspect. But nowadays, we will need only five females to do to, ex to do exactly the same work. And this is really because we have new technology and very, very sensitive with a very high resolution. And this new technology are very important and they, they, they lead to the emergence of a new discipline with the name is chemical ecology. That means chemical ecology is um, the... Um, um, is the link between the ecology and the chemistry. That means you can have an ecological observation, you can have an, an ecological question, and thanks to the chemistry, you will determine what are the chemical mediators involved in the uh, chemical question that you have. And this is, a, I think, this is a very, very interesting um, topics, and which is quite new, uh, because before it was not possible to determine the chemical structure of these compounds or to decipher the different interaction, because we didn't have um, enough performance at sensitive uh, equipment. And that's why I think, I'm sure, that in the future it will be possible to determine not only the molecules involved in the plant talk, or in the plant microorganism talk, or in the plant animal talk, but would be possible to determine all the compounds involved in um, the interaction of the different partners of an ecosystem. And really, really, I think that this is, this is the future of, um, of the language of the nature, and I'm sure that one day it would be possible to, uh, to have a different um, interpretation of this interaction. And uh, it's not to do, uh, I don't know the English word, but it's not to do publicity. <laughs> but we wrote a, a very nice book um, with, uh, with different uh, collaborators about chemical ecology. And this book is very simply and very nice to understand what is really happening in the different interaction in terrestrial interaction, but also in marine interactions. Well, I think that I will finish on this uh, message for the future, for the next generation, and on the importance of the chemistry for the, the understanding of uh, the different interaction that uh, we can find in different ecosystems. 
That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you have some questions, we can share a bit now, like during, I don't know, how many questions you have. But if it lasts really long, we can then all go to the cafe, have some food and drinks. You can discuss and uh, take the time to ask. Your but you can first ask Swazik if you have any or suggestion or comments. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very <laughs> a much. A question so. from a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I will try to, to, to make it for, for the whole audience. Uh, other question will be more yeah, next door. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, to, 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 well, a little bit. Uh, on myself first, I'm working on endophytes for already 13 years, but strictly on a chemical point of view. Now, you touched something very interesting at the end. You mentioned that some endophytes found in some plants are totally are a real endophyte, meaning they are non-pathogen. But in some plants, yeah. they are no, and actually, typically, that's how they were known first. They were known as pathogens of some crop. This is my observation for the past uh, 13 years or so. So many endophytes were isolated from totally healthy plants. Yeah, for sure. When we get the name, yeah, oh, yeah. it's a known pathogen for such or such crop. That first thing to say. Second thing to say, f second observation is when you look at the plant tissues under the microscope, yeah. typically you yeah. never see this endophyte. You see, know yeah, they're yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see the endophyte. Yeah, yeah, with difficult. a very good coloration, no. you can, you can, you sure. But and with fish, do you know with a microscopy, with fish microscopy, now it's possible to target the. No, I know, but generally, if, if you take the standard microscopic techniques which you use, which you use, yeah. which you use to study plant tissues, you never see this because this, and which is very different from um, a, a, when the plant is subjected to some pathogen, where you, you see the overgrowth very, yeah, very clear. Sure, sure. So, the basic, is not the so same it also. means it means that the plant controls the endophytes. It controls its Growth, it controls its si its size, so uh, so there must be some communication between the plant and the endophyte, so that the endophyte yeah, doesn't overgrow yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's just confined to its yeah. role. So my question will be: Do you have any single idea of what kind of communication will be taking place? Are we talking about small molecules between plants and microorganisms? Yes. Yeah. How the plant is controlling the endophyte? Is it, in your opinion, through small molecules, those you have mentioned, or maybe it's other type of compounds like peptides or uh, we proteins? I, I, I didn't speak about that because it, well, it was not the topic, but we demonstrated that the plant is able to produce um, glycosid uh, flavonoids, and this is very helpful for the fungus because the fungus will, um, will, will do a hydrolyze of, uh, of the glycosidic part and will use this sugar to grow inside the plant. This is quite clear. That means by producing this kind of compounds, the plant can decide to help the growth of the fungus. Yep. That means that but typically, it doesn't grow very much. I mean, the, the few I can show you the results. I can show you the results. We the have a, a statistical and significant difference yeah. of the lens, uh, lens if I, This is very clear, for sure. OK. All right. So maybe some, someone else want to ask a question. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was really very interesting. I have a, I'm not a chemist at all. No, 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 worry. <laughs> um, I have a very basic question. I was really interested in um, hearing the first example about the tomato in the fact that it was, in, my, in what I understood, not able to defend itself aggressively, but only to cooperate. Yeah, yeah, she needs, in such case, but she is able also to produce sometimes some toxic compounds, but more against phytopathogens, for example. But again, the caterpillar, the, most, the more uh, useful and efficient ways for her is to produce this kind of signaling that will be uh, detected by the predators, bodyguards of the, of the caterpillar. Mm. 
I thought it was completely fascinating to see an amount of complexity in its defense. And um, I was wondering if we know, we can trace back how this kind of mechanism has developed. Is it more... I it think it's co-evolution mechanisms, right. I think so. But And so, maybe, yeah, I would have a second very basic question is, do we, it seems very advanced and very work in progress. Do we already have an idea of, of what kind of applications there could be in terms of health or in terms of yeah. agriculture? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Thank you. For sure. Uh, we were talking about that with uh, with other people uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of the talk. Uh, it's quite difficult because of course you can use this kind of compounds for for um, like a protection for agriculture and so on but the sole problem and I didn't speak about that because it's very complex that means one same molecule can have different effect on a very huge uh, uh, community. That means if you had a molecule or if you provoke the production of one molecule, maybe this will be beneficial for the tomato, but maybe not for another plant or maybe not for another microorganism, something like that. That means there is a very strong link between all this community and it's sometimes very difficult. For I, this is my opinion. That means if you provoke a disequilibrium of this ecosystem, for sure, um, you will have negative effects, for sure. Maybe not for the tomato, but maybe for another uh, partner of the ecosystem. That's why, that's why the biocontrol or the biopesticide and so on are very difficult to manage, to my opinion. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, totally amazed. I'm not. Com I'm not. I don't come from the chemist background. <laughs> I'm so All sorry. Right. Maybe um, <laughs> said too much chemi chemistry <laughs> in my talk. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if no I worries. say, I would like to know um, how does the plant communicate when the plant does not have enough water or too much water? Uh, which journal can I look for? What can I um, study about it? If there is a cooperation uh, between the, the plant just to, 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 to sense uh, some stress or something like that. Honestly, I don't know. Okay. No, I, d I don't know what, 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 what communication is involved and what is the way of, uh, of interaction in such cases. And I'm not sure, but maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not sure that has been described clearly. And, uh, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think. Because we can imagine that, uh, that you have some chemical signal, but also you can have some chemical signal involved in the microbial community because this microbial community living in the soil or living in the leaves of the plants are also very important for, um, for the health of, uh, of the plant. And this is true for the plants, but it is also true for us. We are talking now about the allobiont concept. That means you are not only one man, you are one man with your Microorganisms and these microorganisms are very influent for your health, uh, for your well-being, and so on. That means we can imagine a lot of uh, scenario, and I have no clear uh, answer to give you. Sorry. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Thank good evening. you for sharing. Uh, just out of curiosity, have you done any research on genetically modified uh, plants as well? Um, and how they react to... Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, honestly, no, because it's not my topic, but we are working on, on genetic or modified fungi. And this is very difficult because the genetics of fungi is, is very hard. And what we, are, what we are performing is all these molecules are driven by, by, by gene, by gene cluster, by biosynthetic gene clusters. And to demonstrate the link in the biomolecular continuum, that means to demonstrate that this gene is involved with the production of these compounds and to do transcriptomics, that means to have an idea of the expression of the gene, we are performing mutant. Um, that means we are delayed and it's very, very, very difficult. But we are working here on genetics and fungi and bacteria, but not in plants because I, I'm, I'm not a 
physiological and not plant physiological. Um, but I know some people who, who, who perform this kind of experiment and it's working well. But um, depends on uh, why you want to perform some genetical modification in plants. Is it for a better production? Is it for decipher the chemical communication? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To have a, a, another another view of uh, of this interaction with genetically modified plant. Um, this, we didn't perform this kind of experiment, and I'm not sure that I've been done. What is sure is that now we try really to 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 use this microbiota to improve the growth of the plant and and for 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 the uptake of the nitrogen. Also, this is a, I think a very nice uh, way. Uh, to promote the growth plant and better, maybe that's a, a genetic modification. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I think maybe we can go on with all the questions while drinking something. That's... Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you.